the vast majority of my photography is in square format, and it has been this way for quite a few years now. In this video, I'm going to share with all of you some things I've learned over the years about square format. I hope that even if you don't shoot in square, you can still get some helpful and useful information from this video. I'm going to be covering some of the topics I talk about in an ebook I'm releasing today about how to make images in square format. This book is available for free to all my patrons and is also available for purchase on my website for everyone else. So why? Why are we even talking about a square format? What does it give us that other aspect ratios don't? Well, a square is a pretty balanced shape. Each side is of the same length, as opposed to the landscape format, which generally speaking lends itself to a more side-to-side -side analysis of the image and to a vertical shot where we're going to be moving up and down. A square image is going to promote a more circular analysis, a more circular movement within the frame. In a way, there is no beginning and there is no end. In my opinion, a square image feels quieter. And that is very welcome in a world where we are being yelled at all the time. For me, it's a departure from that, as it lets me embrace the silence and the stillness of a scene. And of course, I also like it because it's different. Even though smartphone apps like Hipstamatic or Instagram made the Square format cool again, the history of Square goes way back. The first Square cameras date back to the 20s and the 30s in the past century, with brands like Rolleiflex and Voilander being among the first. Of course, it was during the 50s and the 60s when Hasselblad joined the party and made Square format kind of popular among top photographers. It was a Hasselblad camera that made it to the moon, and as far as I know, the images from those first landings were in square. Anyway, fast forward to today, the most popular aspect ratios are 3x2 and 4x3. Those are the default in most digital cameras today. There are also no square digital sensors being made today, as far as I know, which is too bad, because a square sensor would actually take more advantage of the image circle projected by the lens. As you can see in this diagram that I put together, the difference is not very big, but still, it is a fact that a square sensor will have a bigger surface than a rectangular 3x2 sensor used in most APS-C and full-frame cameras today. You might be already familiar with my personal story with score format, so I'm not going to bore you one more time. The one thing I'll say is that I learned most of what I know about the score format by using a Bronica SQAI that was a 6x6 medium format film camera. Today I shoot mostly digital, and sadly, and ironically enough, my camera does not support the 1x1 one one aspect ratio. So every time I look at the screen or through the viewfinder, I see the whole sensor, the 3x2 rectangular shape of the sensor. To help me compose the square images, I use what is called the square grid. I even put gaffer tape on the screen, but that doesn't solve the problem with the viewfinder. And in any case, as far as I know, even those cameras that do support the square format, most of them, if you shoot in RAW, they will still capture the whole 3x2 readout of the sensor. Some of them will include some metadata in the RAW file, so the editing software will know that you shot that image in Square and it will crop it automatically for you. As I said, my camera has none of that, so I have to manually crop them in post. It is one extra step, but it's totally worth it because I really love square images. So let's talk about some compositional techniques we can use in our square images. Some of them will be more specific to the square format, but most of them can be applied in some way to whatever aspect ratio you might be using. One important thing here is that I believe that you should be thinking in square from the beginning. You should compose for that final square image. Of course, you can revisit some old rectangular images and find some good square crops, but you're going to get much better results if you go for the square intentionally from the beginning. The first one is to place the subject in the center. So the rule of thirds doesn't really apply to square. You can still use it, but placing the subject in the center is the most natural way to compose. 
This works especially well with clean images when there are not too many distracting elements around the subject. As we said earlier, the eye tends to move in a circle around the frame, so the cleaner the image, the better. This is a composition I love, I have quite a few examples, as I believe it makes for very peaceful, still, serene and calm images. Another very important compositional element to keep in mind when composing a square is where to place the horizon. In a square format, we could split the frame in two and it could look amazing, this works very well. It could be done horizontally, as you can see in these examples, or it could even be done vertically as well. And then, of course, we could place it on the lower third of the image or the top third of the image with very different results. A lower horizon is going to give the elements, the sky, the clouds, whatever we have there, much more importance. If we have a subject on that horizon, it's going to feel smaller and more vulnerable. The opposite is true. When we place the horizon on the top third of the frame, the subject will feel much bigger and the dominant force in the landscape. Here I find it very useful to divide the square frame in nine smaller squares. This can help quite a lot, not only with the horizon placement, but also with subject placement. Let's talk now about some of the things that we can do to guide the viewer through the frame, because the last thing we want for them is to become lost. The image doesn't have to be obvious at all. As you know, I like to create mystery in my images, but you have to give the viewer something, some kind of instructions of how to read the image. One technique I like to use is gradients, both exposure and focus gradients. What I mean by exposure gradient is a smooth transition from dark tones to bright tones or the other way around, so we can lead the viewer to whatever we want in the frame. A good example is this image I made at the Great Salt Lake in Utah, there is no subject in this image, but I used that transition from the bottom left darker tones to the top right brighter tones to guide the viewer in that direction. Another example, a little bit more subtle, is this image from Madeira, from the Fanal Forest. As you can see, the bottom left in the original image is quite bright and is quite distracting, so by applying a linear gradient in post, I made it darker, so the eye, the movement of the eye, becomes more clear. The same idea applies to what I call focus gradient, and it's a smooth transition from out of focus to in focus and again out of focus elements in the frame. It is once again just another tool that we can use to guide the viewer through the image, as you can see in this image from Death Valley National Park of this dune, the very closest foreground is slightly out of focus, then the ripples of the sand become more and more in focus, they look sharper, and once again the background, the mountains in the background are out of focus. That smooth change in focus, along with the natural direction of the ripples, guides you across the frame in this case. Leading lines. Leading lines is a very important compositional technique in any aspect ratio, including square format. In my opinion, there are two types of leading lines that we can use in a square with very different effects in how we read, how we interpret the image. The first type is a bottom to top or side to side leading line. In my opinion, those leading lines are very useful at helping the viewer get across the frame, while at the same time keeping that stillness and peacefulness and calmness of the square format. The same cannot be said for diagonal lines. Diagonal lines, in my opinion, create a lot of tension and it can make for very dramatic images. They break that circular movement of the eye, that natural movement that we have with the square format images. These are a couple of examples of the same subject, but shot in different ways, in ways that show the subject as a diagonal line or as a straight bottom to top line. As you can see, the images with the bottom to top line feel a little bit more balanced, while the other ones with the diagonal lines, they are more tense and more dramatic. Layers. We finally made it to my favorite compositional technique for square format images. As I said many times, the eye tends to move in a circle around the square frame. But that's not always the case. Sometimes we take the image as a whole. There is no movement at all. 
One way to achieve this is by layering elements in the frame. So instead of moving around the frame, we move in, we zoom in, we get deeper and deeper in the image. I have no better example than this image I made in the Eastern Sierra in California. As you can see, there is a mountain behind a mountain behind a mountain. To create those layers, we can take advantage of that natural effect that happens when you have objects at different distances from you, as the closest objects will look darker and the farther away objects will look brighter. Another way to create layers in your square images is to use that division we did earlier, you might remember, in the nine smaller squares. For example, look at this image I made in Lago di Gorda in Italy. As you can see, the first layer is the foreground on the lower third of the frame. Then we have the subject and the middle ground, and then we have the background on the top third of the frame. Those are three layers. Shapes. The square format can accommodate other shapes within the frame much better actually than other aspect ratios, especially when it's other squares or circles. So here you are seeing a couple examples. The second one from the Grand Canyon is the typical case, the classical case of a frame within a frame. These were some of the compositions I look for when I'm making square images, and that is always as I said, I have a few more in the book. I have plenty more examples as well. You can also check out an older video of mine about a square format that I made some four years ago. I'm going to leave the link up there. I hope this was useful information, regardless of whether you shoot in square or not. But if you don't, you should give it a try. You might like it. If it helped in any way, please consider giving a thumbs up to this video and subscribing to the channel if you want to see more videos like this. That's all for today. Thank you so much for watching and see you in the next one.